uh, design thinking, uh, design thinking processes, and uh, design thinking tools. So what what I'm going to do is uh, again looking at the time frames, I'm going to give you the design team uh, design thinking tools as we go through the thinking process, right? So it's not going to be a separate module that we're going to be covering here. And like Rajesh uh, said that at the end, we might have some time uh, remaining for q and and we we'll take up. So you can put in your questions in the chat box and then looking at what's relevant for us and what can be covered in the meeting itself. We'll try and answer that now, at least maybe a few questions by the uh, end of the session, all right? So having said that, let me quickly move on to uh, starting with, with an example, because one of the things that uh, we tout about a lot as consultants when we talk about design thinking is that it's actually one of the most practical innovation tools, all right? So let's start with some example, uh, with an example of how it's actually worked in the real world before we move on to what it is all about, right? So this is uh, Bank of America, a small little case here where they were looking at a way to increase the use of their savings accounts by customers. And remember this is US, so uh, the customers were not really, not really all that, uh, you know, in terms of savings account, they're not really all that keen on managing that, right? So what they did is they applied the des design thinking uh, methodology and started engaging with customers and uncovered one of the things that they uncovered was that people liked the act of saving, right? They liked the act of saving. Uh, more than the actual amount that they save. So it doesn't matter whether you, you're saving 5,000 rupees, you're saying saving 10,000 rupees, or you're saving 500 rupees. It is the act of saving that they really liked. And that is what they uncovered when, we were, when they were going through the design thinking project. And as a result of which, they came up with this initiative called Keep the Change. Now, what Keep the Change does is it would save automatically with everyday purchases. So for example, if someone bought something, which was, let's say, I'm converting it to Indian rupees, right? You, bu you buy something which is 556 rupees, it gets converted uh, into 600 rupees and the remaining amount is saved, is, is transferred, uh, sent to your savings account from your checking account, right? So again, this is US, so that's the way they, they work, right? And uh, so what happened is, this is what they came up because they realized that people like the act of saving more than actually the amount that they are saving, okay? What was the outcome of this? The results were staggering. Bank of America gained over 10 million new customers and $1.8 billion in savings for them, right? So that's what design thinking can, can do. And this is for a very well regimented uh, bureaucratic bank, all right? So imagine what design thinking can do for startups, right? But we'll talk about it. Before we get into it, let's look, quickly look at the history without spending too much time on it. Uh, so it's this, the concept comes not, it's not a new concept. It's, it's right, it's been there since 1950s where John Arnold, who was a professor of engineering at MIT and then at Stanford, he laid the foundation for first talking about design thinking. And then that piece was taken over by a lot of other thinkers during that time, right? Uh, but at that, time it was more you know synonymous with design you know reach into research into design or philosophy and things like that uh, how did design thinking come into uh, the fold of the new age right now a lot of credit for this goes to IDEO IDEO is of course a design company originating from California it's very famous for having uh, created the design for the first apple mouse Right? And that's how they became pretty famous. And that's when David Kelly who was the founder uh, of IDEO. He wrote a book called Creative Confidence. But again, they were not really talking about design, design thinking or using design thinking as, as a nomenclature. This, was, uh, this came into the fore in 2009 when Tim Brown, who was the executive chair and CEO at IDEO, he wrote a, uh, he wrote a book called Change by Design. And that's when he actually used the words design thinking. And that's how it really, really became big, right? David Kelly, by the way, uh, also is uh, the founder of Stanford Design School, which is again, synonymous with design thinking and teaching design thinking to scores of people across the globe. Right, so that's a little bit of history. In today's world, design thinking is used by any and every big company you can think of. Netflix uses it, Airbnb uses it, 
Google uses it, Citibank uses it, LinkedIn uses it, Nike uses it, Apple uses it, Braun uses it, right? So you name it, the company generally speaking would be using design thinking in some format or the other, right? Now the question is why? Why is design thinking so popular as a method, all right? So first let's look at what do we mean by design thinking, right? So this is how the founder of IDEO, David Kelly, uh, defines design thinking. He says it's a design thinking is defined as a human centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology and the requirements for business success. All right. Now let's simplify this a little bit more, right? What is he talking about here? There are three elements that he's talking about. One is desirability. So a lot of times we talk about innovation, but the question design thinking asks is, is it desirable? Do people really want it? Right? So what is it that people desire? And that's usually a lot of times, what is it that the customer desires is the starting point for the actual uh, innovation, uh, brainstorming, whatever, whatever you might want to call it, the start, starting point of it. So it starts with what do people desire? Then what can be financially viable? Right? Because a lot of times you have a great idea, but it just doesn't make financial sense. Right? So is it financially viable? And finally, uh, is it feasible? So what is technically and organizationally feasible? Can I, as an organization, go ahead and do that? Right? So for example, if I am a manufacturing organization and I am manufacturing tires, can I get into manufacturing apps? Uh, can I get, get into manufacturing medical equipment? That may be a long shot, may not really work for me. Right? So is it again, technically and organizationally feasible? So when you have these three elements together, that's what we call as the innovation sweet spot. And that is why design thinking is so powerful because it ensures that it is practical at the end of the day. The innovation is you're not innovating for the sake of innovating, right? So that's the first part. Now, what design thinking does is it combines your analytical and intuitive thinking very well. And we'll see that when we look at the process because the process involves your, uh, you know, the right brain, your creative, intuitive, empathy, imagination, everything there. But at the same time, it also talks about facts, sequencing, linear thinking, and, and so on and so forth. So it is a great amalgamation of the two. And that is why it works so well. Because a lot of time innovation, you know, when I, especially when I talk to clients, they say, you know, we, I want my company to become more innovative. You know, I want people to think more uh, creatively. You know, we want to be more agile. I keep on hearing these, uh, you know, statements thrown out. But for a lot of them, the question is, it's, there is no framework. Right? Yes, you can do brainstorming, but brainstorming is just one part of the entire process of creativity or making your organization more creative, right? This is where design thinking can really, really help, ladies and gentlemen. Right? So, how is it different? So, traditional thinking uh, is about flawless planning, right? It's about getting in, ensuring that you have a good plan. And then, once you have a good plan, you go ahead and execute. Nothing wrong with it, by the way. This is just how design thinking is different. This is about enlightened trial and error. So it believes in prototyping, trying something out, seeing if, if it works or not, and then moving on, right? So that's, that's what we call as enlightened trial and error. You're not doing trial and error for the sake of trial and error. You're learning something each time, and then you're moving ahead, all right? Uh, traditional thinking is about how do I, you know, ensure that I don't fail. This is about failing, but failing fast and moving on, moving ahead. In fact, Facebook at its initial stages had this, uh, saying which was uh, fail fast and break things, right? Of course, as now it's a, it's a big conglomerate, conglomerate, things change now, but when they started off, that was one of the things that they believed in, right? Uh, then it was about rigorous analysis. Traditional thinking is rigorous analysis, whereas design uh, thinking is about rigorous testing, going ahead in the market, wherever it is, testing your ideas, not just sitting and analyzing you know, behind closed doors, but out there in the market, wherever the customer is going out there and testing your product and seeing product service, whatever, and seeing whether it works or not. Uh, traditional thinking is about presentations. Design thinking is more about lightweight experiments. So the whole idea here is we are not going to break the bank to start something. We're going to see what's the minimum viable product or process that we can create and we can test it out, right? We can experiment with. Uh, again, traditional, this is a big difference, yeah, between design thinking and uh, traditional thinking is it's about more about arm's length customer research, 
uh, design thinking is about deep customer immersion, which is going there and sitting with the customer, figuring out what they want and so on and so forth. We'll talk about this more in detail later. Uh, traditional thinking is periodic. So you have a certain amount of time that you spend every, every month, every six months, whatever it is, whereas design thinking is continuous. You're constantly iterating, figuring out what's working, what's not working, and then moving and going ahead, right? Traditional thinking is about thinking. Design thinking paradoxically, paradoxically is about doing. All right, okay, what I'd like to do is, I don't know if I can see your chats, but I just want you to put one word answer, one line answer, whatever comes to your mind. Why do you think innovation? Yeah, if you don't want to call it design thinking, even if you can change the uh, nomenclature to saying, why do you think innovation is important in today's world? I give you about, let's say 30 seconds, and then we'll see. Why do you think design thinking is important in today's world or innovation is important in today's world? We have Dinesh acts rather than Anna. Yeah, it's it's more it's more in in acting rather than analyzing. Innovation attracts more, yep, yeah, more attention. Oh, okay, interesting. It's about creation, yeah, creating more value. Competitive edge, I think I like that. Yes. For less input, more output. Come, yeah. I think more or less new creation. You've got it, you've got, you've got, you've got it absolutely right, right? One another reason is. Yeah, competition always needs new thing. It shapes your approach to solving problems. Yeah, it's very fast moving. I think I, 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 I get the context. The gist of it is that you can innovate and you can do this very, very quickly. Now, why do we need to do this, right? So I have an interesting video for all of you to see. And, uh, you know, let's, let's have a look at it, right? Just to kind of talk about what the world that we are living in right now, right? And why design thinking is important. Okay. So if you're a F1 Formula One fan, you might have encountered this video uh, earlier, but even if you're not, this is a video of pit stop, right? Typical pit stops that you have. So this is a, a difference between the pit stops in the 1950s and in the 2000s. Okay, so let's have a look at that. But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. are changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stops. Seven seconds, right? From 67 seconds to just a few seconds and getting the pistol. And of course, there were a lot of things uh, to do it, you know, to, to kind of ensure that that happened. One of them was also the change in the rules where you could have a few crew members to, of course, having many more. But beyond that, what we are talking about here is that the world we are living in is, is, is fast changing, right? And you have to, again, I think some of you said it, 
in the chat box as well that you also have to be more agile as a company and even as an individual for that matter right so we are looking at a world this was again a term buka was a term coined uh, during the, the the america taliban crisis and they said that it's a it's a buka world that we are operating in that's that's how the military strategy of us was working at that point of time and then that was taken up by a lot of consultants across the globe who use that terminology today to talk about the world in general right but it's volatile we've all seen what's happened over the past two years it's uncertain we don't know what's going to happen in the next two years it's complex and it's ambiguous right there is no clear answer and that's where linear thinking doesn't really work very well linear thinking works very well if the conditions outside are stable but when the conditions outside are not stable that's when linear thinking kind of uh, you know doesn't work so well and that's where you need to then say okay how can i think out of the box uh, to use a cliche but yeah clichés are pretty powerful so why design thinking because it's very practical in the way it approaches innovation tackles problems that are ambiguous or difficult to define leads to more innovative solutions makes organizations run faster and more efficiently right so that in a nutshell is what design thinking does all right let's look at the process now ladies and gentlemen let's get into the meat of it all right but before i move into the process let me just share a short video with all of you uh, it's about 2 minutes long because a lot of times when i talk about design thinking a lot of companies you know they can hey you know what design thinking it's for netflix uh, it's it's for uh, amazons of the world it is not for us we are a small company we are a startup uh, what have you right and i say you know what nobody has uh, you know uh, a sole proprietary right on innovation right anybody can actually build an innovative company all you need is an idea and execution of that idea and creating a culture around it right so i always kind of show them end up showing them this video at some point of time or the other just to highlight that innovation does not need money all right so let's have a quick look at this video and then we'll take it forward from there tung lugar namin ah sitio maligay dos san vicente san pedro la muna Eh, siyempre, alam mo naman, ganitong lugar, squatter area, tabing rilis, dikit-dikit ang bahay. Madilim talaga rito sa lugar ko na to. Wala kami dito sa loob, lagi kami sa labas. Nadadapa kasi madilim, dadaan mo, hindi mo alam, may nakaharang. Tutulog na lang ako, lailaw eh. Ang tawag nyo na saan dito eh, si Mang Demi Solar. Napaliwanag ko yung mga bahay nila magdilim. Bubutas ka ng yero. Lalagay mo yung buti, lagyan mo siya ng sealant bago lagyan mo siya ng tubig na mineral sa lagyan ng sundrops. Bago kabit mo sa bahay, lagyan mo sealant mo para hindi tumulo. Ganyan lang kasimple yun. Dati yung ganyan tukang dilim nung bago ko pang kapitan. Ngayon nung kapitan ko na, ito na ang liwanag niya. Ngayon na liwanag. Pumili po ako kasi bote lang, tubig. Maliwanag na yung bahay mo. Pumaba yung ano ko, binayaran ko ngayon. Simula lang makabitan ako dito. At saka itong solar battle bag na to, hindi mainit. Dahil sa buti na yan, sa solar na buti na yan, gumanda ang araw namin. Ang nalagyan na namin ito ay bali 643. Gusto nga namin tuloy-tuloy para marami nga matulong ang mga tao rin na ano, yung maliwanag ang mga bahay nilang madidilim. Parang katulad na rin ng bumbilya. Yung sa atin natin nakakalimutan at pakinabangan na ngayon. Yeah. So, yes, it doesn't require money. It just requires ideas. Now, the question is, how do you generate these ideas right and how do you then make it a part of the process or an organizational culture that's a different conversation altogether but let's look at how you can actually create that and is there a process around it right so this is what the process looks like it starts with empathize right so empathize is all about going to the customer like like we said earlier it's about immersion right so you're figuring out exactly what is it that the customer requires what is it that the customer wants so that's the first piece which is empathize then it talks about defining the problem right what exactly is the problem we'll talk about each of these elements more in detail as we go forward and then from define you move to ideate 
right? And that's where you actually get into the brainstorming, the ideation, the out of the box thinking, whatever it is that you generally hear about a lot of people talking about when we talk about innovation, right? People generally talk only about brainstorming, but it's just one part of the entire process. And again, there are different ways to do brainstorming. We, we talk about one method, but there are many more. And then there is prototyping where you're actually now creating something and out going out there and testing it out, right? So that's what the process looks like. It starts with empathize. Let's start with empathize and see what it means to us, right? So again, I like I shared earlier, uh, I'm going to share quickly share a couple of tools that you can actually use while you're doing something like this, because that's very, very practical. So one of the tools you can use uh, or one of the tools that are generally used, again, there are a lot of ways to do this, but one of the tools that is used uh, when you look at empathize as a stage is something called as an empathy map, right? Where you kind of figure out what is, what is the customer or the user thinking about? What is he doing? What does he feel? What does he say? Uh, one of the things that a lot of times the traditional formats miss out on is what is it, what, what does the user feel about something, right? Uh, so here's an interesting example of this, right? So uh, Renault, we all know Renault as a, as a car company here in India. Uh, initially, they had a tie-up with, uh, you know, I believe the Mahindras. And that tie-up was not very successful. And then finally, they were looking at saying, okay, we want to introduce a car in India, but you know we've not been very successful. What do we do? So what Renault did is they got their engineers from France and they got them to sit and talk with the Indian customer. And they said, what do you guys want? You know, they asked the Indian customers. They sat with them. They spent time with them. And they said, what is it that you guys want? And a lot of Indian customers said, we want a nice car, but we don't want to pay for it. right? <laughs> we want it to give nice mileage, uh, we want it to look good. We want, you know, we, we love an SUV, but again, we are not willing to pay for an SUV, right? So that those were some of the things that came out. And that's when, of course, they launched the quid and taking the feedback from the customers, they came up with the quid. And of course, we all, we all know how well the quid did and it kind of changed the way people started looking at small cars in India itself, right? So that's that's the power of empathy, figuring out what the customer wants. In fact, if you look at one of the biggest companies in the world, Amazon, right? One of their values is customer first, right? Customer obsession. That is what they call it. Jeff Bezos used to call it customer obsession, figuring out what the customer wants before they before they even know that they, they want it or they need it and things like that, right? So that's that's the quick story. That's the first bit which is called as empathize, right? So once you've empathized, you've figured out what your customer wants, uh, you kind of had, had that heart to heart with the customer in whatever format, right? Remember this, this is just one tool that I'm sharing with you, right? The empathy map is just one tool. There are lots of other tools also, but you've done that. Let's assume you've done that. Now let's move into the define piece, right? So here's, here's an example. Define is about creating a problem statement. And trust me, in my consulting career, there are so many times I've seen, this is the stage where a lot of people get it wrong for whatever reasons. They either don't define the problem well, or they are not actually figuring out what the problem is. And you know, I, I love this example. This is an example of uh, General Motors, and this is the Pontiac division of uh, General Motors. And they, they received, a, you know, the general manager received this uh, letter from one of their customers. And this was the gist of the letter, right? The letter said, you know, I like to go with my family and we like to have ice creams, you know, and we go in this uh, Pontiac, this lovely car of yours, we go to buy, I go to buy ice cream for my family, all right? Uh, any other flavor I, I buy, I have no problem. But every time I buy a vanilla ice cream, when I start back from the store, my car won't start. If I get any other kind of ice cream, the car starts just fine. I want you to know I am serious about this question, no matter how silly it sounds. What is there about a Pontiac that makes it not start when I get vanilla ice cream and easy to start whenever I get any other kind of ice cream, right? So, you know, of course, the General Motors team had a big laugh, but the general manager, he said, you know, this guy, this customer, he, he, does, he, looks, he looks to be pretty in his space. You know, he's not some crazy person who's sending a letter out to me. This looks like a regular person who's been using Pontiac and this looks like a genuine complaint. 
So he sent one of his engineers along, you know, to check what's happening with this customer. So the engineer goes and, you know, they, they have their dinner, the family has a dinner, the engineer is sitting with them. And then, you know, the guy says, okay, let me take you to the ice cream shop. And that day they decide to have vanilla ice cream. All right. Uh, and uh, well, guess what? When the, when the guy goes in, buys vanilla ice cream, comes back, uh, the car doesn't start. Now the engineer is wondering what's, what's wrong, what's happening here. So he says, let me come again tomorrow or, or the next week. So again, goes back. This time there's some other ice cream and guess what? The car starts. So now the engineer is worried. He says, what's happening? I mean, vanilla ice cream, car doesn't start. Uh, you know, what's, what's the problem here? What's happening? So then the engineer goes inside the shop to see what's happening there. And what he notices is this, that vanilla, because vanilla is a fairly popular flavor, right? Vanilla is kept right there, okay? Right next to uh, uh, the person who's selling ice cream. All the other flavors are kept behind. So whenever you order any of the other flavors, it takes time to bring it to the customer. So now the engineer realizes the problem is not the vanilla flavor. The problem is time taken for the car to start, right? So whenever it's vanilla, you go back, you, you, he can come back pretty quickly. So it's a short time that is taken. Whenever it's any other flavor, it's a lot longer time, right? So now he's defined the problem correctly. Now there is a solution. Of course, they realized that there was some part in there which was getting heated up or got cooled down pretty quickly or something like that. But the whole idea here is that one of the elements of, of, of uh, problem solving is to look at the problem and say, am I actually defining the problem correctly? And trust me, so many people get it, get it wrong because again, usually when problems come, they just come you know, multiple at, at, this, at the same time. And especially if you're doing multiple things, then it becomes very, very difficult. But spending some time in design thinking, we say you need to spend that time to figure out and create problem statements, right? There's a small little tool here, which is an interesting one that I'd like to share with you. Uh, in design thinking, it is called reframing the problem, all right? So what is reframing? Reframing is a tool to think differently about an issue by exposing your conventional wisdom that stands in the way of the progress. So what happens is you're thinking there's a problem. Let me give you the most famous example of this, right? So this is the slow elevator problem. Imagine someone comes to you you are the owner of an office building and your tenants are complaining about the elevator, you know, the lift. It's old and it's slow and they have to wait a lot. So several tenants are threatening to break their leases if you don't fix the problem, right? So what comes, what's the problem currently? The elevator is too slow. And when you find the solution, what will be the solution? You will say, make the elevator faster. So install a new lift, upgrade the motor, improve algorithm, whatever answers that may come, come to you, right? Now, if you reframe the problem, right? The wait is annoying. What are people actually irritated about is about waiting. That is what they're irritated, irritated about. If I change that context and I reframe the problem in this way, then what happens is the solution is a little different, right? Make the wait feel shorter. How do you do that? You put up mirrors, you play music, you install a hand sanitizer or whatever it may be, right? Something for people to do. In fact, you will see that in a lot of hotels, lobbies, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So what happens here is you are reframing the problem and you are changing the entire context of the solution itself. Right. So that's reframing the problem. This is again another tool uh, when you're looking at doing this. This is another tool that you can use, which is reframing the problem. So number one tool is creating a problem statement. Right. Another tool is again reframing the problem and seeing how can this be, how can I look at this problem differently. Right. Some very famous example. Netflix reframe the problem. What if people could watch TV and watch mo movies anytime, anywhere, right? So they just change the whole game there. Uh, what if you could get Uber? What if you could get an affordable on-demand chauffeur, not need cash, right? So that again is a very different way of looking at the whole thing. And again, here is a problem reframing by Airbnb. What if people were willing to stay in private homes instead of hotels, right? So instead of buying hotels, making hotels, tying up with hotels. I just change the whole problem. And when I change the whole question, I change the reframe the question. I come to a very different conclusion altogether. All right. Now there are like different ways of going into it. We're not getting into it right now, but that's where it is. So 
first you start with empathize figuring out what the customer is all about what is it that they want then you look at defining what's the problem that you're trying to solve you may also reframe the problem at times to figure out where you're going now you get into the ideate stage this is the stage that you heard you know n number of times people talking about it right so walt disney does it so they have these brainstorming rooms and walt disney has a very simple brainstorming process in case you're interested they have something called as the uh, green room and the red room so when initially when you're ideating you go into the green room and when you get into the green room you're not allowed to uh, you're not allowed to say no to any idea so you just dump all the ideas onto this board and then they all go to the red room and red room is where they question all the ideas on the board and that's where they bring in their uh, you know their linear thinking right so you start with lateral thinking then you move on to linear thinking that's one way of brainstorming there are lots of others i like this because it's fairly practical doesn't matter if you're a project manager doesn't matter if you're a business owner you can still run this within your uh, with your team right so what it does is it's called scamper the tool is called scamper and what scamper does is it gives you these trigger words you know gives you these trigger words to kind of think because a lot of times you know imagine what happens is this you get your team right five ten people together and you say okay this is the problem let's brainstorm but nobody comes up with any new idea they are all kind of just re you know rethinking recapping the same thing over and over again right this is where scamper as a tool is really really useful now what scamper does is this so it has these trigger words so for example take any product process uh, you know service whatever you you want to take and then you say okay what can i do to substitute can i substitute some element in this process right can i combine some elements in this product can i adapt some element of this product or process or service and make it change can i magnify something can i eliminate something now by the way eliminating something is is the is the most difficult thing to do when you're innovating because whenever you're innovating what we are doing is we are always adding stuff you know but eliminating is 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 difficult it doesn't come intuitively it is very counterintuitive by the way that is what steve jobs did right he was he was a master at eliminating he eliminated the keyboard <laughs> right and that's that's how we got the full screen handset for the first time in the world right so eliminating has its benefits but that's not something that usually comes to people's mind right to eliminate something rearrange a few things right so this basically gives you those trigger words to think about what are some of the things that you can actually go ahead and do so i'll give you a, share some some examples here mcdonalds does quite a few things i've kept i picked up a couple of things for us to look at put to other users right so uh, when you say put to other users uh what what mcdonalds does is selling restaurants and real estate instead of just simply hamburgers right so they are not using the uh, the restaurant concept only to kind of sell hamburgers they are also selling restaurants at the same time they are also selling real estate right so that's one of the things that mcdonalds does uh, by the way they are i think one of the they have the highest amount of real estate space in the world among among the top 10 or whatever it is eliminates right so this is something that mcdonalds does again letting customers serve themselves and thereby avoiding the use of expensive waiters so most of the time the customers are serving themselves you go you go to the mcdonalds you go you take you place the order you carry the tray and you go back right so they eliminated the need for waiters right rearrange this is another thing that mcdonalds has does does which is very different from our typical odp joint right so having customers pay before they eat so you pay first and then you go ahead and then you eat right so that's an example of rearrange again that's a rearrange in the process it could always also be a rearrange in the product it could also be a rearrange in the service right so some classic examples here of combine combining a product so apple has done this very recently with their mac safe uh, line of products where they say okay what if i combine a credit card holder with a uh, with my iphone case all right what happens then right and things like that so apple has used that eliminate another classic example is the mythical fridge uh, this was a fridge by made by one gentleman from gujarat and uh, this fridge does not re- need electricity so he eliminated the need for electricity in in uh, in the fridge and these these by the way sell like hotcakes in africa where you know getting electricity is very very different 
very very difficult and then finally uh, uh, i think the club the classic example of magnifying which is keeping on adding to a product is a gillette fusion right i mean it started with one blade then two then three then four then five right i think that's where we are somewhere i think they have five blades and then they have one behind or something like that so yeah that's a, that's an example of magnify so this again this is a great tool stamper is a great tool to kind of pick up and use whenever you're looking at doing brainstorming just don't do plain brainstorming i think it's interesting to kind of add this adds a little bit more spice to your brainstorming session all right so that's one tool in ideate and then prototype right so this is where you know i i one of my clients is unilever and they use they use they 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 use another element not not exactly design thinking but it's related to prototyping which is the lean startup right so uh, unilever typically for any uh, to decide on a flavor right this was one of the challenge this was in uh, europe and this was one of the challenge i have these two flavors of jam which flavor should i go for typically in unilever that takes 6 months you go with the traditional approach decide which flavor to take it takes 6 months in unilever right they did this time they did it in about 2 weeks how did they do do, do that they use prototyping what is prototyping they just took those two flavors they had these chaos they set up a chaos in front of all the malls and all the theaters in europe and they had these people sit there and they would ask people hey you know what would you like to taste our two jams and can you tell tell me which one do you like more done that that's prototyping so prototyping is about not trying to create that brilliant best product but picking up and just starting to work creating a minimum viable product and then working with it right that's what it it looks like now again there are lots of tools here but the key element to remember here is that you are not aiming for perfection you are aiming for something that is doable something that you can start off and work with right this by the way i don't know if any of you can guess what this is you can put it in the chat box i'm going to give you 5 5 seconds anybody can guess what this is Five, four, three, two, one. iPod. Okay, close, close. <laughs> Not so close, actually. It's the Apple Watch. <laughs> that was the Apple Watch, right? That was the prototype for the Apple Apple Watch, right? So it's it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to look that way, right? It's just about kind of getting ahead and doing it. I I love this small video. I'm going to show you a part of this video. Okay, it it just. talks about prototyping so well i'm not going to show you the full video but i'm just going to show you a part of what it is because it just explains what prototyping what am i talking about here more than anything else prototyping and testing right Yeah, you get the picture. 
right? So that's what prototyping is all about. It's about testing, going out there, putting it out, whatever your idea is, figuring out a way of putting it out there, and then you move ahead from there, right? So that's what prototyping looks like. And then of course you are testing. So you're prototyping and you're testing. So there are various ways of doing it. There is also a rapid proto prototyping, which may work for some companies which may not work for a lot of companies. Again, if you are into doing research and development work for NASA uh, or ISRO, then of course that's not what you want to do. But in a lot of cases, you will find that this is really, really something that can work very well, right? There are again, tools for testing. Uh, I, I remember, uh, you know, uh, by the way, testing is something that even Bollywood does. Yeah, I remember Amir Khan was giving this interview long back in I, one of the IA, I think it was IIM Ahmedabad. And he was saying that when we make a movie, uh, we then show that movie to a set number of people and we get their feedback and we make changes on that, right? Which was, again, so he was one of the pioneers. This is something that traditionally in the US and even in the South Indian movies, I think this is pretty something that is fairly common, but uh, he was the one who brought it to Bollywood. Now, I think almost all the movies more or less do it, right? So they test it out, take feedback from the end user to figure out whether this works or it doesn't work, right? And again, these are different tools. A very simple tool is what do you what do you like, what do you wish, and what if, right? So this is a very simple tool. Again, these are just triggers that you give to the consumer. Uh, you can also use the feedback capture grid, which talks about what do you like, what are the criticisms of this, uh, what are some of the questions you might have around this, and what are some of the ideas you have about this? What, what is it that you can give? Because sometimes, you know, the ideas can come from uh, someone you never expected them to give you that idea. I, I remember the story of the, uh, you know, the elevator where there was this building in, in London and there was a hotel. It was a hotel that was being made in London. It was, all, it was built already. And after the hotel was made, they realized that the, lifts that were given, the elevators that were there in the hotel, they were not going to be enough. So now the architects and the builders and everybody is fighting it out, saying, you know, what, what are we going to do? The lifts are not going to be enough. The customers are going to be angry. And what will we do? And one of the architects, you know, he came out for a, for a smoke because he was just so frustrated. So he was smoking outside the, the room where, you know, the boardroom where this whole discussion was happening. And one of the janitors came along. Janitors are basically, you know, they're cleaning up, uh, you know, the plumbing and they're doing the plumbing and they're cleaning the hotel and things like that. So the janitor comes there and he says, you know, what's up? What's happening? And uh, the architect tells him, he says, oh, you know, we made a big mess. We, we, uh, we've not created enough lifts for the, we've not created enough elevators for, for the people, for the customers. And now we might have to break an entire suit. So one line of suit will have to break on all the floors and we have to build elevators there. And the janitor looks at the architect and he says, uh, oh, well, why can't you have elevators outside? And the architect looks at him and he says, oh my God, yeah. Why can't we have, you know, this outside? And never thought about it, right? So he never thought about it. And uh, that, that, was, that, that for him was, was a challenge, right? So he went in, he got this brain brainstorm and he went in and he made this huge appeal to everybody and they all agreed. And that's where we had the first capsule lift. So the capsule lift that we see today in almost all the malls, you will see there's this capsule lift, right? Uh, that capsule lift was the idea of a janitor somewhere in, in London, right? So the ideas can come from anywhere. So it's great sometimes to ask customers also for ideas because maybe they might see it in a very different way altogether. Right? So this is what the process looks like in a nutshell, everybody. Empathize, ideate, uh, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And as you can see, it's an infinite loop, which basically means you keep on doing this. It's a continuous process. It's not that it ends at some point or the other. All right. Okay. Let me end with this quick story about another example of design thinking in a very different setup. So we've spoken about banking. We've spoken about manufacturing, but hospitals, this is not where we actually think about innovation, right? So this was a case with uh, GE Healthcare, where, you know, having an MRI scan again is not a pleasant experience for adults as well, but it, it was especially harrowing for children. 
right? And usually the children would be crying and, you know, things like that. And that was what the chief designer at GE, uh, you know, he was, he was really, he really felt for the children, right? So he said, I have to do something about it. And he was taking part in one of the design thinking labs at Stanford at that, that point of time. And then he applied the design thinking principles, decided to observe children, spoke with the doctors and nurses to figure out what they are going through, what's happening and th things like that, right? And, you know, what he then looked at is that, you know, the MRI machine didn't look like an elegant piece of machinery. It looked like a scary machine for the young children. So what did they do? This is what they did. They made it into like a pirate island adventure ride. And they actually got all these people from Disney to come and train the doctors and nurses and the people in their hospital as well to kind of see that, you know, how do you treat children and what do you talk to them? How do you talk to them and things like that? So they made that whole experience into a joyful experience for the kids. And what was the result? Of course, prior to the transformation, 80% of the children needed to be sedated, right? But after that, it dropped to 10%. That, by the way, is also cost saving huh? more than anything else. So that is, again, cost saving. All right. So I'd like to end here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to give you guys a. Raj, you've gone on mute. Yeah. So I'd like to, I, I'd like to uh, give you guys a minute for any questions you might have. Or any questions you might have. We have about 10 minutes, everybody. So if you have any questions, anything that's top of the mind, that would be really great if you can share that. Raj, there is a request to share the test slide. Okay. Okay, I'll just share that slide again. Give me a minute. So the recording, Girja, is going to be taken care of, as Rajesh uh, said there. So that's taken care of. Yeah. Okay, so I think either this was really, really good and everybody has understood everything or this was really, really bad, right? But I, I am seeing that everybody is still there, right? So we have, we have 61 people still there. So I'm hoping this was some value add for all of you guys. Yeah, uh, we have some question here, which says mentioning prototype, what happens when customers are themselves confused or not sure of the product? Okay, that's, that's a good question. What happens when the customers, again, so when you are looking at prototyping, uh, you are A, before prototyping, you're actually doing the empathize part beforehand. And you're not asking one person, you're asking multiple. And again, like I said, I've just shared one way of doing it. There are various ways of doing it where you have focus groups with customers to figure out what's happening and things like that. Now, if everybody, all of the customers are confused, I don't think that happens usually. You will, uh, most of the times my, my, as a consultant is, uh, my take on this is the customers know more or less what they want. Uh, at, at times, yes, you may want to look at it from uh, how do I, the challenge is how do I get the internal people to look at things from the customer's angle, which is what Jeff Bezos did very well with Amazon. So if in Amazon, for example, of course, customer obsession is one of the values. They always have one empty chair in the boardroom in Amazon. That empty chair represents the customer saying, what do you think the customer will be thinking about? So if you ask one customer, yes, you might have that, that whole element that the customer is confused, but not every customer is, is going to be confused. Usually the customers and the end users especially are pretty clear on what problem they are facing and what it is that they want to be solved and things like that. So it is just about figuring out uh, who's my target, who, who, how many people am I targeting and how do I go about doing that? And again, the idea here is, let's say you put a prototype and they don't like it. They don't like it. They don't like it. That's fine. That was the whole idea of prototyping so that you don't spend a humongous amount of money 
uh, you know, in putting something and then the customer comes back and says, I don't like it. Instead of that, you, you know, probably spent like maybe 5% and then you found out that the customer doesn't like it. You, so you say, okay, fair enough. You don't like this. What else do you like? And at times you may have that thing that, oh, I, I don't really know. Okay, fair enough. Let's talk to other customers as well and figure out what's happening. So figure out, you know, the, the more people you talk to and the more immersive experiences you have, the better it becomes for you to become clear about what are some of the challenges that the customers have and things like that. But thanks, Kapil, for asking that question. Anyone, anyone else? I hope that answers the question in some format. So there's one more question, ah. Raj, if you can address that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so very, okay, yeah. So uh, what is your message to hardcore R&D based startup? I think if you're, if you're a hardcore R&D based startup, I, the trap that I have seen, especially when it comes to R&D again, so I've worked with Colgate's R&D division a, a lot. And uh, one, of the, one of the problems is that for a lot of the, the, the researchers, getting into the user's uh, mindset is, is becomes very difficult. It's like, it's like a scientist trying to teach his son or daughter, you know, basic math becomes very difficult. So for, for, for hardcore R&D, my suggestion is uh, testing is something you'll generally be good at. Prototyping, yes, I think that also is something that you might be fairly good at. I think the challenge for a hardcore R&D setup is the empathy, empathy part, the first part. So my, my, my suggestion would be then, how can I build that empathy into the system at the start itself? Because then I'm creating products at the end of it, which is actually which are actually going to be useful uh, to the end consumers or whatever my target audience is, right? Okay, uh, can we do design thinking with thinking with no user research? No, that doesn't work because then you're again, uh, it's it's it. Can you do it theoretically? Yes, but I don't know of anyone who's done it honestly. You can still use. By the way, you can pick up pick and choose. You can cherry pick and say, I want to use this for my brainstorming. Yes, absolutely. We won't call it design thinking, but that's fine. Right. But uh, usually design thinking, the start, the reason why design thinking is different and it works much, much better than the other, uh, you know, uh, innovative innovation techniques is because it starts with empathy, it starts with uh, user research first. Ah, where I this I love this question. Yeah, when exactly is the design thinking process uh, complete? We will always look to optimize. Yeah, absolutely. So I think if you look at Amazon, even today they are still looking at they are still looking at how do I deliver faster, right? So I, I like how Jeff Bezos again says it. He he says that I I look at these problems and he has a different way of looking at it. But he says that I look at a problem which is gonna which is not, what is not going to change. So one of the things he says is not going to change is people are, people will always want things quicker, right? There's no, no way somebody is going to say, you know, Amazon is a great company, but I wish you would deliver slower. You know, everybody wants it faster. So Amazon is constantly trying that even, even today. So there is no end to the process as, as such, because it's a, that's why we said initially your traditional process is pre periodic. But when it comes to design thinking, this is more or less uh, a continuous process that goes on. And again, what generally happens is when you start, again, I'm talking from an organizational perspective, when you start doing this kind of a thing, it then becomes a part of your DNA, you know, something that you see Google do, something that you see 3M do very, very well, where it just become part of the DNA, that people are just doing it. Disney does it again, it just become a part of their DNA, you know, the whole, whole process. So it's, it's, a, it's a journey. Not, not an end that will oh, be design thinking here. Yeah, now, you know, I'm, I've done design thinking. Now it's done. Now I can just sit and say, okay, my product is fantastic. I can just continue to sell it. I'll have to keep on innovating because at some point of time, there's another guy also out there who's working on the same product and maybe his product is getting better than mine. Then I'm, I'm out of business, right? So that's something to think about. And again, we're living in a world where this is so real, you know, because... Oh, you have Ola, which is which, which is which is a cab, which was a cab sharing company now into electric scooters and whatnot. So this is a great time, especially to be in India, to kind of do that. So I think that's something I'd like to leave you all with. So Raj, 
the challenge at smes is you know the day to day you know which the challenges that yeah. we go through so yeah. where is the time for design think yeah absolutely where you know you need to have a mindset you are so much in the business that you know design thinking is something you like working on the business you know you have to have a 360 degree view so how do you get into that kind of a culture yeah so again and that's w- what is the mindset that you need to actually start thinking in terms of design process see you the thought has to first come in absolutely yeah 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 so rajesh you're absolutely right in fact if you look at the sme sector right uh up until a few years ago they honestly they didn't even need it and i was talking to to one gentleman and he, he was sharing with me he said you know what raj now the only time i get to think is long flights you know because otherwise you're so indaunted with all the things that are happening one suggestion for everybody this is just generally one suggestion that i give even in my leadership sessions is as a leader you need to create that white space white space what do i mean by white space could be um an hour and a half would be 2 hours whatever it is uh, the founder of linkedin has this one day in a month where he does not take phone calls does not do anything bill gates very famously had think weeks where for a week he would go out to this cabin and he would just think no phone calls no emails nothing right just thinking so it starts with of course the founder himself or herself starting to think and this is this is a great by the way this is this is a great step right where you are attending something like this and you're kind of saying okay ye bhi hota hai so this is something that i can think of, about as well uh on a more process level then you need to at some point create a team which is the design we call them design champions right these are the guys who are then going to incorporate design thinking elements into you know the entire uh, organization and things like that but it starts with taking that time out and and i know as a as a especially for smes that becomes very difficult but you can't say that okay one day when i have time i will start becoming more innovative because then the time may be lost and you may have other people who have already moved ahead in the race so the right time is is now to start thinking about it and honestly it's once you start and it you see the results then you will find the time out because it's it's like saying you know i will find time to exercise when i get fit you get fit when you start exercise is the same thing with with design thinking as well so if you want to become more agile this is the time to start we need to have that create that white space initially for yourself then create a core team and then you move it through the organization uh, again another mistake with a lot of leaders is uh, they try to scale it initially that doesn't work don't try to scale it go go little by little right have that core team and build on them get them get the design thinking muscles ready then you scale it up within the entire organization especially if it's if it's a bigger organization All right. So, so Rajesh, any, any other questions? questions? I think I don't see one more question. Uh, thank you for explaining me. Such a, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank yeah. you, Priyanka. Thank you, Anil. I think uh, we have. We don't have any more questions, Raj. So, uh, I think I'll just take this opportunity and wind up the session. And sure. uh, just for the uh, for the benefit of the members here present. uh raj also is uh in the okr space which is very widely used in uh by google it was initially done uh, at intel and then later on google uh, incorporated it it's a beautiful way of running an organization and he is an authority on okr also so if anybody would like to reach out to raj i think he has shared his details here please uh, look into it and we will be also able to help you connect with him and uh, i take this opportunity to thank you raj for taking the time out and explaining about design thinking to us it was a wonderful session uh, you know there's much more depth into what you have actually discussed i think this is just the tip of the iceberg absolutely absolutely you would yeah. look forward to more or probably if everybody is interested on a one day session or a two day session that you can conduct uh, if anybody would like to go into the depth then we can think about it because this goes uh, in line with the theme that we are having for this year in you know, ideate innovate and implement so you know it fits fits in with very much with what we are thinking in the direction that we want to go and help the smes that are involved with us to move forward so thank you again i 
take this opportunity and thank all the participants who joined in, who are there with us and who participated uh, in a very positive and a nice way. Thank you so much. Thank there you, are very different so organizations that have joined us uh, today, apart from BI. So I take this opportunity and thank all of them who have joined us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Raj, for taking thank the you. time. Thank out. you. We'll, we'll thanks, you thanks, Rajesh. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everybody at BIA. And thank you, everybody, for joining in as well. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Take care.